Welcome to this episode of Real Chemistry. This is the first part in a three-part series on how to tell if a molecule is polar. In this first part, we're just going to look at if a bond is polar. So what that means in this video is we'll first look at what it means for a bond to be polar, and then we'll do some practice problems on how to tell if it's polar or nonpolar or, in some cases, ionic. So first, what does it mean for a bond to be polar? Well, here I have a molecule shown. It's hydrogen bonded to fluorine. Remember that bonds, that little line I drew, represent electrons that are holding our atoms together. And those electrons can be shared or are shared in the case of a covalent bond, but they can be shared equally, that is hydrogen and fluorine both have about the same amount, or unequally. Polar bonds are when electrons are shared unequally. So that's when electrons in our bond are shared unequally. So one has more than another. So in this case, fluorine turns out to really tug on those electrons and it pulls it towards themselves. And so this big red cloud you see around it is a bunch of extra electron density that it's pulled over from hydrogen. So it's winning that battle for electrons. And when that happens, we can actually indicate that with the Greek letter delta. So that's the Greek letter delta. And if it has more electrons, we put a minus sign. And if it has less electrons than we'd expect, we put a plus sign. So here we would say that hydrogen is a little positive and fluorine's a little negative. Now it turns out if your electronegativity difference is great enough, we can actually get to a full minus one and a full plus one. And this electronegativity thing that I'm referencing is critical in figuring out if a bond is going to be polar. It tells us how much an atom wants electrons. And we've actually quantified that with a number. So every single element has a number that tells us how electronegative it is. For example, fluorine over here has a four. It's actually the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Meanwhile, my magnesium has a 1.2. And so we've organized all of these values and put them on a periodic table. And there's actually a periodic trend that tells us if electronegativity is increasing as we move across it. It turns out that as we move from left to right, our electronegativity increases. And as we move from top to bottom, our electronegativity increases. The only exception to this rule is the noble gases, which have been left off of this table. They don't follow that trend. But otherwise, the periodic table follows this trend, and you can use the electronegativity values here to figure out how much an atom wants electrons, and from that, if it's polar or not. Now, remember that a polar bond is something that's sharing electrons unequally. And that doesn't just depend on the absolute value of electronegativity. It depends on the difference in electronegativity. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. So the electronegativity difference tells us if it's polar or not. If we take the difference between two of these numbers and we get between 0 and 0 0.4, that means we are dealing with something that's nonpolar. They're basically sharing those electrons pretty equally. If we get something between about 0.4 and 1.8, it's polar. They're not sharing them equally. One of the atoms in our bond is pulling more of the electrons towards itself. If we get a really big electronegativity difference, 1.8, then that actually makes it ionic. That means it's fully taken one of the electrons. They're no longer shared in a covalent bond. It's actually been transferred in an ionic bond. Here's the equation we use to do it. This delta thing means change, and this En refers to electronegativity. And then all we do is we grab a value from the periodic table. Let's say we have boron, we plug that into E1, and nitrogen, we could plug that into E2, and we take the difference. These lines here just mean we're gonna take the absolute value. Okay, it doesn't matter which one you assign as E1 or E2. Let's actually do a few practice problems. First, we have CCl. So we have carbon and chlorine. So all we do is we calculate the change in electronegativity by grabbing the electronegativity of carbon. Again, doesn't matter which one we grab first. And then we subtract the electronegativity of chlorine, which is 3. And when I do 2.5 minus 3, I would get negative 0.5 but those absolute value bars make that positive. So it doesn't matter if it's a negative or positive, we just make it positive. Now we go over to our chart and we see that that actually is polar, it falls between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5. So we know that this means that's a polar bond. Remember here, we're speaking only of a bond, not of the whole molecule. So a bond could be polar, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a molecule is polar. 
And a molecule could be polar, but it won't mean that every bond in it is polar. Okay, let's do CH. So again, all I do is I grab my carbon value, which is 2.5, and I subtract my hydrogen value, which I have up here as 2.1. That gives me 0 0.4. Now, technically, that's on the cutoff. So you can see here it says less than 0 0.4, or between 0.4 and 1.8. But it's very important to know that CH is nonpolar. So it's right there at the edge, and we consider it nonpolar, which is an important thing to remember. So CH is right there on the edge, but we consider it nonpolar. So our carbon hydrogen bond is nonpolar. All right, lastly, let's go ahead and take a look at lithium and chlorine. If I have lithium, it has an electronegativity value of 1, and I subtract chlorine, which we already saw has a 3. That's going to give me, when I take the absolute value, 2.0. Now, on my chart, I can see that when it's greater than 1.8, that actually makes it ionic. So, what that means is that these top two bonds we took, to, took a look at are both part of covalent molecules. So, these are covalent. That means they share the electrons. And if it's a polar bond, like CCL, they share them unequally. If it's a nonpolar bond, like CH, they share them pretty much equally. Ionic means our electron has been transferred. It's not shared anymore. So because the electronegativity value is so great here, the difference in the electronegativity values are so great, the electron is just fully transferred. Okay, that's what it looks like for bonds. Let's do one more example where we look at it in the context of a molecule. And then what we can see is that we have to look at it bond by bond within a molecule. So here I have two bonds, right? I have a bond between carbon and hydrogen and I have bonds between carbon and nitrogen. And so I can look at each of those separately. So let's do that. Let's look at my hydrogen carbon bond. Well, once again, we already saw that the difference between hydrogen and carbon was 0 0.4, and we said that that was a really important example of a nonpolar bond. So that's nonpolar. So our CH bond is nonpolar. Let's think about our carbon-nitrogen bond. It doesn't affect anything that that's a triple bond there, that that has three lines. So our challenge in electronegativity is going to be grabbing the carbon, 2.5, and subtracting the nitrogen, which is 3.0, and I would get 0 0.5. So that would actually be polar. So if I think what's going on with this molecule in terms of the charges, nitrogen's been pulling some of those electrons towards it. So nitrogen would be partially negative, and carbon would be partially positive. And my CH bond is nonpolar, so I don't need to write any charges over there. They're sharing those electrons more or less equally. Okay, that's how you tell if a bond is polar. If you want to tell if a whole molecule is polar, you have to also look at symmetry, and then you can do that. So the second video in this series is going to be all about molecular symmetry. And then lastly, we'll put those together and decide if some molecules themselves are polar or nonpolar. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry. You can always leave a comment below if you have any questions.